Oh, I think I see oh, that says live, go. right? Excellent. So uh, for uh, for everyone that was here in the meetup, you you had a chance to read the slide a little bit. So there's a, a little bit longer intro. So I'm going to shorten the intro just a little bit. Um, but our speaker tonight is Lars Clint. Uh, he is a senior developer evangelist with Pluralsight. Uh, that gave him an opportunity to be here in Utah just last month. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he gets here every uh, occasionally, but this is not where he lives. Um, he's an author, trainer, Microsoft Azure MVP. Uh, community leader, aspiring YouTube YouTube host, and part-time classic car collector. Uh, he is heavily in, uh, involved in the space of cloud computing services and co-organizes the DDD Melbourne Community Conference. He's spoken at numerous technical events around the world, runs a part-time car restoration business, and is an expert in the Australian outback internet, uh, including kangaroos we learned uh in in the little premium yes. we just had so uh yeah. we're going to turn the time over to lars clint for build an image resizing app using serverless on azure awesome now can i steal the screen off you gary uh you should be able to i will stop right. sharing i'm gonna all right cool i'm gonna see what happens here hello everybody thanks for joining i'm just gonna do uh which one i must uh that one i think all right, so you should all see a very pretty slide now, I'm guessing, yep. uh, which is not very interesting. But yes, hi. Um, there we go. My name is Lars. Um, I am here basically because I did a live stream, which is similar to this for Manning, which I'm writing a book for, and Gary kind of saw it. So here I am. Um, having said that, yes, I'm writing a book. You can get involved. Um, there will be some more about that later on. Um, but this talk is sort of related to that book because I did so much work writing books, damn hard. Um, but I work for Pluralsight, as Gary was just mentioned, uh, which meant that I was just down the road from Salt Lake City like two weeks ago, which was hilarious. The fact that I now talk at the Salt Lake City um, .NET user group. Anyway, um, I am a Microsoft MVP, which means they give you lots of stickers. Um, it doesn't mean I work, I work for Microsoft. It just means that they sort of recognizes the community work and they give you an award. Um, it's, it's nice. It's a good community, um, but I don't do community stuff to be an MVP. I get the MVP award because I do community stuff, if that makes sense. So it's sort of a, you know, it's nice tip of the hat kind of thing. And I do have a YouTube channel. So um, I'll, I can link to that later on, but yeah, I'm, I do all sorts of nerdy stuff on YouTube, um, mainly because I live on a farm in the middle of nowhere. Uh, which I just showed Gary and, and Steve before I had kangaroos outside my window like two hours ago. <laughs> so that was kind of cool. Um, but yeah, I, I do home automation stuff. I do networking stuff. I do uh, devices, Lenovo devices, all sorts of stuff. And I put it all on YouTube. So if you want to join me there, you can, uh, I, I can link to it in the chat a bit later on. Cool. So I did, Manning did give me this MTPS, uh, MTP, Salt Lake City .net 22 code which I think gives you 40% off the book or something, but I'll link all that at the end as well. But there is like a special code thing, which means you can get involved with the book that I haven't finished writing, which is kind of weird to me, but here we go. It's called the Morning Early Access Program. It does mean you can comment on it and I can edit the book based on your comments before it gets published. So that's kind of neat. It's an interesting way of doing it. Anyway, <clears throat> oh yeah, you can win a free copy at the end. Um, so I have one full, fully free copy. I'm gonna, we'll do the prize draw at the end. So however that works out, but there is one. Um, so my way is always, hey, ask questions. Please do ask questions. It's the best way to learn. And it also know I, uh, it means I kind of know you're listening. So if you do have questions, put them in the chat, uh, come off mute, whatever you feel comfortable with. I don't mind being interrupted because I do talk a lot. Um, and there's a lot of talk in this presentation because we're building a whole thing, right? So. Okay, with that, let's talk a bit about this scenario that I came up with. Now it's a bit contrived. I know that uh, it's hard to come up with a fully real world example for you know demonstrating things like this. But let's say this. So right, a company that sells photography and imaging service has a service that lets users send their images via email for an online photo album. Yes, it's very 1997. I'm aware of that, but bear with me, right? Now this company, when you send it via email, the online albums are growing in size because images get bigger, right? We get more and more pixels. We get bigger and bigger file sizes. So that means that the website loads uh, slower. 
And therefore, we need to resize these images. So how can we do that automatically? And that's where we're going to build a yeah serverless sort of um, process to do that. Um, so that's the scenario that we're sort of pretending. Now, why am I choosing this particular approach? Well, I wanted to scale well, right? Scaling, if, I mean, by the way, how many here do uh, cloud computing for any sort of work or have done it? Does anyone work with Azure every day? I can't actually see the chat. Let me just find the chat. Hang on a second, because it, as I shared my screen, it closed the chat. There we go. Now I can see the chat as well. So feel free to, to comment on the chat. Um, but one of the really cool benefits of cloud computing and Azure for that matter, <clears throat> being a cloud platform is the scaling part of it, right? It, it keeps scaling. And for, as there we go, Steve works with Azure regularly, perfect, right? So hopefully we have a nice range of people that don't use Azure, some that use it and some that use it a lot, right? Moving over to AWS, perfect. So Simon's there, I believe. Are you the Simon Hole? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Oh yeah, Gary is split between Azure and GCP, right? So we we have some idea of cloud if we don't work with it every day, but the <laughs> Simon is the Simon Hall. Um, and um, we want to have scaling as part of this because cloud computing's when we're a consumer, it seems there's infinite scale. We can always get another machine, we can always get more resources, more RAM, more everything, right? So scaling is one of the reasons we choose this, especially with serverless. Um, here we go. Cost effective, we want to make sure we can manage the costs. We don't want this to cost uh, you know, too much because then this image product uh, product is not going to be very uh, lucrative. And we want to reduce maintenance. Who, who likes maintenance, right? We want to make sure that there's not a lot of yak shaving. We don't want to have too much um, maintenance after the fact. We don't want to constantly have to update things so again, cloud uh, pass or serverless is a very good way to do this. And of course we want it to be robust. We don't want it to fall down all the time, right? So those are sort of the, some, well, those are the four main outcomes of why I sort of come up with a solution that we're gonna build now. Don't worry, there's not many slides. There's, most of this is gonna be in the portal or um, otherwise. Anyway, here's the architecture that we are gonna be building. So it'll center around this logic app um, which are very cool. And I, I, I absolutely love logic apps because they make my manager look really good if I'm a software dev developer because they're really quick and really robust. Um, this logic app is going to check my exchange online, my email account. In this case, we just I'm just going to use my own email account. And it's then going to take those images that comes in on email, puts them in blog storage. There'll be an Azure function that then monitors that blob storage. And whenever a new image comes in to go, oh, I got to resize this, yay. And then it takes that image, resizes it and puts it back in blob storage so that this imaginary website can then use those images. And when you click on the image, say, for example, you could open up the larger one, for example. So that's our architecture uh, very quickly. <clears throat> and we're going to use the Azure portal and Microsoft Outlook because Outlook is a perfect developer tool, right? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Right, so let's build something. That's all the slides I had until the end. Uh, okay, so I'm just gonna make this a bit bigger. So here is my Azure account, Azure portal. Um, is, does this, if this does not look familiar to you, if you've never seen this before, give me a shout, because it's kind of important that I just give a quick intro to what this is if you haven't seen it, because otherwise you get lost real quick. I'm just watching the chat. Anyone, we all good? Okay, Alex has never seen it, Kevin. Perfect, all right. So, and I'm sorry, but I'm just gonna call you the Hollywood stars, haven't seen it before, because they're like amazing names, I'm sorry. It's just when you live outside of the US, I just noticed that. Um, so this is the Azure portal. <coughs> <coughs> oh, sorry. <clears throat> and uh, in AWS, it's called the console, in GCP, I think it's called the console. Well, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's basically the main UI for interacting with uh, the cloud platform. So Azure has this, they call the portal, um, and you can do pretty much everything through the portal. Uh, there's many ways of interacting with a cloud platform such as Azure. The portal is one way. Um, up here, there is what's called a cloud shell. So if I click on this, it comes up with a little command line. And in this, you can then use bash. So this is the Azure CLI, the command line interface which is all, as it says, it's all command lines. And you can basically 
command your way through creating Azure stuff, um, Azure resources, et cetera. That's what I would use if I was using Azure day to day, um, like if I was on a project or whatever, because it's so much quicker, right? And everything you can use it doing the portal, you can basically do in the CLI. But it also means that you can automate it. Um, you can also choose to use PowerShell if that's your poison. So PowerShell uh, or, or Bash in the Cloud Shell. So I'm just trying to sort of exemplify that there are multiple ways of using Azure, not just through the portal, but for a presentation like this, the portal makes more sense, right? So I'm gonna use the portal exclusively uh, in this presentation, but it's not the only way. Okay, uh, Simon has a question for later. Well, I don't know when later is. Uh, is there much delay in spin up time for Azure Functions similar to AWS Lambda? Ah, interesting. I will get to that question. Thanks, Simon. And uh, now that I have it in mind. So, the first thing uh, we need to do on Azure is to create a resource group. Everything in Azure has to live inside of a resource group, which is a logical container for your resources. So, a resource group on its own doesn't do anything. Uh, it, but you have to have a resource group. Every resource must be inside a resource group. So I can click create. Again, there's multiple ways of clicking, of creating things. We're gonna, I'm gonna try and do as many as I possibly can through the portal here. But one way here is just to click on create, a little pop-up thing that comes up, and then this will load. So this is a very standard wizard way of creating stuff in Azure. So you're gonna be seeing this kind of flow multiple times today. So I'm uh, lucky because I'm a Microsoft Azure MVP, they give me the Microsoft Azure sponsorship, which means they give me an obscene amount of Azure credits because they want me to do a presentation like this and play with things and figure out how things work so I can talk about it, right? So, um, but having said that, if you create an Azure free account today, if you wanna do any of this, you can. Um, all of this can be done with an Azure free account. So there's that. Again, I'm gonna call this SLC net uh, G. So everything today is going to be SLC net. This is my resource group. Naming, again, naming is hard but important. So try and find a way that either works for your team, your company, or just you if it's just you. Uh, East US, sure. Actually, I'm going to go for Australia because I'm in Australia. So everything I'm going to do is going to be in Australia East. But the region, the region is important to choose, right? Um, you can have different resources, resources from different regions in the same resource group, right? So you don't have to, you don't bound by it. <clears throat> but re region is important when it comes to choice of service because some regions don't offer all services on Azure, but also price. <clears throat> For example, one VM can, call, can have one price in US West one and US West three, it'll be more expensive for whatever reason, because Microsoft, I'm not sure but it can have an impact on it. But this is it. This is all there is to do <clears throat> with that resource group. So I'm just gonna click review and create, create that resource group. And these are quick, right? Because there's nothing, it, there's no resources being created, but I have a resource group now. So does that make sense? Yeah, I hope. Um, so again, apologies if you already know about Azure and resource groups, cause that was a long version of it. But now hopefully um, Kevin and Alex has a little bit of a better idea of where we're starting. <clears throat> Okay, so the first thing we have to do is if I just go back to my slides here, is if we look at the architecture, is that we need the blob storage. Like that's gonna be the first thing because everything has to talk to the storage, right? That's where the logic app puts things, that's where the Azure function gets things from. So first step is to create a storage account. And again, so let's click on storage accounts instead and it'll show me, it'll show a list of all the ones that I have. So these are for various reasons, projects, other talks, et cetera. And again, there's a create button. I can click create and we get the same wizard experience in just a second, just here, right? So it looks very familiar already, I hope, to what we just did before. Now I'm gonna choose the same resource group because one of the reasons that I choose the same resource group for these for talks like this is that at the end of the talk, I can delete the resource group and it deletes everything inside of it. Right, so I can clean up after myself so it doesn't sit there and, and, and suck up costs. We're gonna give it a <clears throat> account name. So I'm gonna call the SLC net, oops, storage. And again, I can choose to put it in Australia East. Some of this is gonna go a bit quick because we only have an hour. <laughs> um, so if there is stuff that, I, that you think is important that I might skip over, let me know. Again, just yell out. 
Um, performance is standard or premium. Standard and premium basically means do you want a spinning hard drive or do you want an SDD, an SSD, sorry. Um, that's sort of really a high level. That's what it means. Um, standard, it's fine. And then we have redundancy. How do you want your data to be backed up? Where do you want your redundancy to be? And locally redundant means that it's at least three copies of it is in the same data center, which is fine for our talk. That's the cheapest, of course. But the other ones, such as geo-redundance, are within the same geography. So that's in different data centers in the same sort of location. Um, and then there's zone redundant. So in Australia, for example, I can choose that my storage account is in Australia East, which is Sydney. And if I then choose zone redundant, the other part of it will be in a in like a partner region, which will be Australia Southeast, which is Melbourne. But they're far enough away so that if one gets flooded, the other one's fine, et cetera, et cetera, right? But you pay more. The more you know, sort of protection you want in redundancy, the more you pay. So that's, I'm just going to choose local. That's fine for this talk. <clears throat> then there's some advanced settings. Um, again, I probably won't change many of these, but that doesn't mean you should know what they do. It's one of the very, like we've, oh, I would say we've all been through the wizards where we go next, 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 install, and off we go. You can absolutely do that with Azure, but there's a few risks and we'll get to those in doing that without understanding what it is you're clicking next to, right? So for advanced, we have the security bits. Um, do you want to enable blob public access? Well, that's a big one. Like, do you want public access to your blobs? Again, I'm going to leave it because we're going to sort of use that today, but you might not want that. <clears throat> um, enable storage account key access. So that means um, any request to the account that I was already sharing error, like you will be denied. So you, you can sort of limit the access to it, right? And this is really important if you're in a big company, you can't just set up stuff. And obviously, obviously Often there's policies for how these things are set. So Azure has a concept of policies as well, which we won't go into today. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff. The main thing I'm look at here is the access tier. Do I want hot or cool? Um, Azure actually has three access tiers. You can choose hot or cool in this setup. Hot is, as it says, frequent access. So they're sort of kept in memory and they're always available. They cost more. And then there's cool, which means they're kept on disk and they get loaded into memory. So there's like a, it takes a little bit longer to get the files, right? And then there's also an archive tier, actually, which is equivalent of keeping them on tape. Like it takes 10, 12 hours to retrieve the files, but it's incredibly cheap. It's really cheap to store data on that. Um, like we're talking fractions of a cent per gigabyte kind of thing. All right, I'm going to leave that as it is. Hot's fine. Networking, again, enable public access from all networks. I'm going to leave that on. Um, you might not want to do that, but I'm going to do that in this case. And then there's some network routing. I'm not going to go into that. Data protection. This is your your you know soft delete and your uh, tracking of data. I'm going to again leave that as it is. Encryption. Do you want to use Microsoft's key? So all data is encrypted by default, but it's just whether you want to use Microsoft's key or your own key to encrypt this. Um, and then you can you know have different types of support for customer managed keys. And that's it. Well, I say that's it. <clears throat> in fact, all I'm doing now is I'm creating a container for storage. So a bit of history, a long time ago, Microsoft decided to roll a bunch of different products into one, call it a storage account. Um, this includes four different types of file storage or data storage. So there's a file share or file storage, which is kind of like your file system on your computer. Basically, you can attach it to a, as a remote uh, as a um, remote network kind of attached storage. You can do different things with it. Um, there's table storage, which is um, something Microsoft says you should use Cosmos instead. Table storage is really really good without using Cosmos because Cosmos is expensive and difficult. Uh, not difficult, complex. It's not difficult. It's just complex. Um, just go to my resource here. I'm going to go to the storage account. So you see on the left here, data storage, we have containers, file shares, queues, and tables. So file shares, I mentioned, table storage is a really simple way of having data stored in tables, and it's crazy fast and very cheap. Um, if any of you are this, familiar with the service, have I been pwned that Troy Hunt runs? He has billions and billions and billions of records. They're all in table storage, as far as I'm aware, and it's crazy fast, right? Um, there's queue storage, which is, as the name says, it's a FIFO queue. 
you know, you can put things on the queue and pop them off the other end, but you can have millions of things. And it's a great way of reducing any bottlenecks because these queue storage are very efficient. Um, and then there's containers, which is what we're using, also called blob storage. Um, so I'm going to go into containers and you can see it's already created one for logs. So that's okay. That's not one we're going to use. A container is, think of it as a folder of files. So we're going to create a new blob container within our storage account, which is where we're going to store our images or blobs. Right. So it's like three layers. And we're going to give it a name. So we're going to call this, uh, let's see if I get this right. <clears throat> uh, do, 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 do. Okay. So this is where we're going to store the original images, right? So I'm going to call this uh, original images. Keep it simple. And then we have again the public access level. I'm just going to go with blob. So this is, you can access the blob directly, anonymously, if you have the address, but you can't, um, you know, enumerate the, the folder or the blob storage. So there we go. Okay. And that's it. The advanced has other things. <laughs> so I create a folder, uh, container. Again, this is really quick because there's no actual data going into it yet. So now I have a storage uh, account with a container in it where I can then place the images that I sent. That makes sense? I can see everybody's nodding. Yep. All right. So the next step is to then create this logic app. So let me just go back to my uh, architecture here. We've created the blob storage. It's where we're going to store the images. Now we need the logic app that takes the uh, images out of Outlook or out of Exchange and puts them into blob storage. So that's the next step. So uh, another way of finding sort resources on Azure is there's a really nice search bar up here. And if I type logic, it gives me everything that has to do with logic. So for example, it could be services, logic apps, it could be in the marketplace, it could be you know documentation, whatever it is that has the word logic in it. So I'm gonna go to logic apps. And again, you can see there's already one that I have. This is the one I use in my book. So I keep that as reference just in case. <laughs> but we're going to add a new logic app. So just add it. And again, we're going to put it in that same resource group, the SLC one, so that we have everything in the same resource group. We're going to call this SLC net image fetch or something. Now you can see it comes up with a little tick here on the side. And then it says .azurewebsites.net. Some of the services on Azure, such as your storage account, uh, your website, so that's your app services, they're called app services, um, the logic apps, they have a public facing um, entry point, I guess, which is a URL. So these names have to be unique across Azure, not just across your account. And sometimes that can catch you out if you have like a generic type name because someone's already done it, right? Um, it doesn't really matter what they're called as long as it sort of made sense with your naming because you can always have a redirect with from another URL. That's possible. But yeah, that's why you see this little tick that sort of, if I you know do this, you can see it goes a little spinny, spinny thing just to make sure that that is a unique name. Um, you then choose as a, do you want a workflow or Docker container? Because you can absolutely have it as a container, your logic app. Um, we're not going to do that today. I'm going to do with workflow so we can see it building. And then I'm going to choose again, Australia East. And then we have a plan type. So this is standard or consumption. And this is um, kind of consumption is basically serverless. Um, so you pay per execution of the logic app rather than a standard is where you pay a bulk or a, a, a flat base fee. And then when you get to a certain level, you pay a bit more. So that's if you use it a lot, that's better value. Um, if you have a, you know, for a demo like this, or you have, um, you know, inconsistent usage of it, consumption might work better. So we can choose consumption. And you can see it actually changes again because consumption is not uh, available in all regions. So, um, and then you can see, uh, it actually removed that workflow or Docker container because standards, uh, Docker is only available on the standard plan type. Anyway, we're getting into the weeds now. Um, uh, zone redundancy, uh, basically how, how worried are you that your logic app is going to go down? Is it important that it runs all the time? So I'm going to leave it as is. Now, 
So it Lars, says, if I can interrupt for just a second. Absolutely. So when you were uh, when you were talking about how, that URL needing to be uh, mm -hmm. unique across all of Azure, um, with all of this being contained in a resource group, when you delete the resource group, does that also clean up that URL? So, so if you yes. do the demo, the same do the do the same demo four times, you could use the same name four times. But uh, definitely, yeah, I can. I'm not sure up. if that's instant. Like if it's I delete and it's available again instantly, there might be like a caching thing or whatever for who knows where that's stored. But yes, yes, you can. It will okay. remove that. Um, so we're not going to run out. Um, if we just clean up after ourselves. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to create the logic app. I'm sort of not creating the logic app, really. I'm creating a container for my logic. So as we'll see in a minute with Azure Functions, everything has to work, live inside an app kind of thing. That's sort of the Azure Microsoft way. And this is just a way of saying, hey, there's a virtual machine behind it that runs it, right? But it's serverless, so it's someone else's machine. Right, that's what serverless is. It's we're using someone else's uh, services. Um, if you're familiar with the infrastructure as a service, platform as a service, software as a service kind of um, progression of platform choice uh, in cloud computing, serverless is sort of a, a version of PaaS. It's a sort of version of platform as a service where you have access to a whole bunch of um, triggers and properties and stuff, but you don't actually control the underlying virtual machines or anything like that. So it's sort of in that. That region. Um, so now I have my Logic App um, designer experience. And again, as developers, and I, I'm aware of this, <laughs> I like writing code. There's not much code in this. There will be a little bit in the Azure Functions, but bear with me because I'll, I'll show you why this can be a good thing as well. Um, I think as developers, part of our job is to find a solution, not necessarily just write great code. Right. The coding is what we love. And I'm assuming that's why most people go into software development is like that crafting experience or, hey, I'm writing something really cool. But in, in we are there to serve a business goal, right? If we can get to that business goal using a tool that's more efficient, such as Logic Apps, I'm all for it. So that's sort of my approach to software development. Um, so our Logic App is built from triggers, which are, there's some examples on them here. Um, and actions, right? So there's something that starts this flow and um, then we have actions based on that flow. So that's what we're gonna build. We're gonna build something that, you know, luckily there's a trigger here. It says when a new email is received in Outlook.com, how convenient, I know. Um, but you could also build one with a blank logic app or there's, there's a whole bunch of different templates. I've never really used the templates uh, other than for inspiration. It's, it's like with anything template. It's a bit like PowerPoint templates. They're like, uh, right? They're a little bit meh, not quite what I need, but they give you an idea of where it might go. And these are a bit the same. Like who has peak lock with a service bus message? Like, I, I don't know. Like it, it just seems a bit contrived, but they're there. If you do like logic apps or go through them, to have a look through them and, and you know, kind of get a sense for what's possible. But I'm going to start with the outlook.com trigger. So here is the Logic App. It will connect to Office 365 Outlook. Uh, this is the designer experience of a Logic App. Um, oh, here we go. Steve saying, I've heard the saying code is a liability, meaning if you can solve a problem without code, you might have less liability. Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably what my manager would say as well. Um, I, I hear what you're saying, and, and it's like, I, I love code, right? I, I like writing code. It's one of the things as you get more senior, you end up writing less code. And it's sort of like, eek, irks me a little bit because it's like if you're a junior, you get all the cool stuff because you're like, hey, try this out or whatever, right? Not always, but it does happen that um, that happens a lot. So code as a liability, yes, could be, but I think that has to be part of the design, project design phase. It's like, okay, are we going to solve this with code or are we going to find a tool that does it? Um, I don't know. Yeah. But, but you're right, you have less liability if you have less code, for sure. <laughs> um, that's why something like serverless is so popular because there's so much of the platform is removed and you just sort of focus on a thing, right? Um, really situational, there's no point to reinvent the wheel. Well, yeah, absolutely. Like if you can copy from Stack Overflow, absolutely. That's kind of why they created the keyboard, right? It's a joke, but it's also so true. Who hasn't done it? So um, <laughs> absolutely. So. Um, I'm going to sign into my own Office 365 because that's easier. Uh, it's open in a different window, so just bear with me for a sec. I'm just going to sign into Microsoft. That's all I'm doing. 
So I gotta choose that. And then I'm gonna come up with a, oh no, it's already there. Okay, I just click one button because I just signed in before to try and preempt this. So now I'm signed into my Outlook, my email account, me at lastclean.com. Uh, if I wanted to, I could, you know, switch account, add a new connection, etc. So what I've created now is I've created basically a connection string um, through OAuth with Microsoft's um, authentication system, right? And I'm saying to Logic App, use this connection. That's why, that's all I've done. I haven't actually told it what to do yet. So I'm going to click continue. And now it says, oh, when a new email arrives, arrives what do I do? What, what do I do? Well, I want it to be in the folder of inbox. Yeah, that's right. That's fine. Importance normal, sure. I don't think that matters too much. I can actually just remove that, take that out. Um, I can add a new parameter because we're going to look for attachments, right? So if I just say, well, only with attachments, because I'm not interested in emails that don't have an attachment because we're looking at images, right? And then I want to include those attachments. Absolutely. So I want those two fields. So if I click away from that, they're going to pop up here. So you can see. So only with attachments, and then you say yes or no. So that's also a way of saying, like, no, I don't want attachments. Um, but yes, only with attachments. And yes, I do want to include the attachment in my later flow. How often do you want to check for items? Well, it doesn't really matter. We're going to do it a bit manually, but you can set a, a timer here. I can do one minute because it's a test, right? And then, because I'm a compulsive saver, I always click save. Um, so now I've created that first bit. Now, what happens now when it gets the email? Right, there's an, attach there's an attachment. Um, and again, one of my assumptions is that the attachment is an image. I'm not gonna go through the whole flow of saying, oh, if image, then this, if not, then this. We'll leave that for later, don't have time. <laughs> so I'm gonna add a new step. And this step in here is gonna, oops, sorry. I'm gonna choose an operation. So I can search for blob because I wanna put this in blob storage. And then, give it a second. I can click on, I mean, they're already here, but I can click on Azure blob storage and it gives me all the different actions that I can do natively within Logic Apps with Azure blob storage. And I'm gonna create a block blob like that. And someone's gonna ask me why block and not just blob. And to be honest, I can't remember. That's why I wrote a book, so I can look it up. Um, I just remember I looked through it and I thought, no, it has to be a blog, but I can't remember. So if everyone knows, let me know. Um, again, this is the, the beauty of live presentations. Um, okay, so the connection name is just a name. And we're gonna need an access key. Aha, we need somehow to authenticate with a storage cap. Right, so what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna open up a new, instance of my portal so I don't have to so I can switch back and forwards and in here I'm going to go to my storage account SLC net storage and in here on the left if again if you're not familiar with Azure I apologize if it's a bit fast and there's a lot of stuff going on um, but basically this is the same view of all resources on Azure it'll have a menu down the left and it'll have a bunch of things in the middle, like an overview, for example, will have some of the most commonly needed properties. Um, so in this case, on the menu on the left, I have access keys, right? So I'm gonna click on access keys. And here are keys I can use to authenticate with um, within Azure for, uh, or, or outside of Azure as well, actually. Um, and I'm gonna show the keys and you can see here are the keys, there's a connection string and a key, right? So if I need to, use these with a connect with an access key, I'm, I'm gonna use these keys. So this is what we're doing in this case. So I'm gonna copy that first key. There's two keys because good practice is to rotate the keys, which means that you set key one to key two and you replace key number two, right? And you do that every three months or something. Because that means that if you forget to remove access for things that shouldn't have access, well, it gets removed every three months. So there, that's why there's two. Now I have my access key. I'm going to go back to the Logic App Designer. I'm going to call this connection. I'm just going to call this SLC storage account because that's what it is. Access key, I could use also Azure AD integrated, which means I set it up in Azure Active Directory as an app, which is more complicated than what we're doing just now. Or I can use managed identity, which is probably the way I would do it if it wasn't in preview. So managed identity is basically saying that uh, Logic App has its own identity within Azure, 
And then I allow that identity to have access to the storage account, which is a very nice way of doing it. It removes a lot of this sort of, um, uh, what's it called? Um, manual entry of stuff, right? So, oh, the storage account name is SLC net storage. So what I'm doing now, I'm creating a connection string, essentially saying, hey, use this, these credentials for this Bob storage. And that's, again, then it's gonna say, no, no, last pass, I don't wanna change, save that. So then I get drop downs now because I'm already authenticated. So I'm gonna use the connection settings, yes. And then when I click the little folder, it should show me ah, original images. So that's the folder or the blob container that we created before, which it now knows about. So I can choose that. Again, it means I don't have to type things manually and get it wrong. Um, and then we'll get to these bits in just a minute. Do, 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 do. Make sure I got my cheat sheet on the right here. Um, okay, so we want to have um, specified name of the blob to create. So Logic App has this idea of dynamic content. So these are basically variables, and they're getting passed from the previous step to now. So I can reference it again. So it could be from, to, subject, etc. So the name of the blob to create, it's going to be the attachment name, right? So attachments name. Uh -huh. And then see what happened? Uh, this confused the hell out of me the first time. It created a for each because it's recognizing that when an email arrives, it might have more than one attachment. So it's creating, as soon as I say, I want to look at the attachments, go, ah, there's more than one. I'm going to do for each for you. And then all of these things we just added actually is still in here. It just, it closes it. So that's what it says here. Based on the output parameters you selected, we've added it for each container. Cool. Very helpful. Because that catches you out the first time if, if you don't do that. Because then you're trying to reference an attachment. And if there's more than one, it becomes an array. And then it goes bang. And you go, what the hell happened? So we've got the blob content. And this is, again, I'm going to search for it here. Uh, the attachments. Oh, hang on. Content. Yeah. And then I'm going to add another parameter because just because I said before, remember how I said it, hey, it might not be an image that's attached, it might be a Word document. If we were to do something about that, we can actually add, add the content type. So I'm going to do that just so that you have sort of half an idea. And again, this is going to be the attachment content type. So what I've said now is that I've told, um, I'm going to save it. I've told the Logi app to get the all the attachments and then add them back into the blob storage in the folder called original images, right? So let's see if it works, eh? So, okay. So I'm going to send myself an email. There we go. Simon, thank you. Block. It's because each block can be different in size and we don't know how big the attachment is going to be. That sounds good. I'll take that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go here and I'm going to send a new email. Here we go. I'm going to send it to myself on that vein. No. And we're going to call this SLC net image. Oops. Quick type. And then we're going to attach an image. Uh, where'd it go? Insert. Here we go. I don't know how to outlook. Attach a file. Browse this PC. And we're just going to go desktop and there'll be something here. We can put a picture of, I don't know, something weird. There we go. MVP. Summit bonus virtual event. Actually, I'm going to try and choose a JPEG, to be honest. Um, just because I know that works. Again. Maybe a picture of Christian. Here's a picture of my son. And I'm going to send that to myself. Also, because it's a big image. That's half the, half the point, right? is that the, the image is going to be quite big. Ooh, Sa Simon's doing all the referencing for me. Thank you. <laughs> <coughs> all right, so I've just received the image. So let's run this trigger. So I'm running it manually now because it's not running on a, on a schedule just yet. Oh, click run. And then this is going to spin up a VM. It's going to run my logic app. It's going to check for an image or email. All right, so we get three green ticks, tick, 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 which means something happened. So we can go in and see here in the create block blob. Uh, oh, hang on. Let's see here. Uh, output 
what am I doing? No, it all seems to have an image. Yeah, so this says it had an attachment. Uh, yep, yeah. and there's... Uh, ruh, 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 ruh. No, okay. I thought it would actually show me a bit more. <clears throat> so I can see the outputs of what actually came out of the Logic app, but much more interesting, let's go into the container. <clears throat> I'm gonna go into my original images and, oh, there's a picture. Well, there's a file, there's a blob. And so I can take this URL here. So remember I said it, the blob to publicly available. That's actually this storage. So you can see that SLC net storage is part of the URL. That's why it has to be unique. So if I copy this, let's just see. Yeah, I've got the file extension. I should get that image. Let's see if it works. Hey, there he is, right? Looking like an angel. That's a rare sight. Um, so that worked. So now we have that file in blob storage and we didn't really do much, right? It was, it was really quite simple. Um, hang on. Yeah, we'll go back to, I don't know. Uh, what did I do? Designer. Here we go. So, <clears throat> okay. Does that all make sense? So now I've got this part here, right? I've got Logic App getting an email, putting it into blob storage. Now we're going to do the Azure function side of things. So this is a, this is the interesting bit or the more interesting bit. Okay. So has, uh, has anyone never heard of Azure functions? Just as a preface here, like how much detail do I give? No. Okay. So an Azure function is like the original serverless darling of Azure. It's very similar to an AWS Lambda function. They're sort of going tit for tat in terms of you know features and speed and et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, <clears throat> so we'll create an Azure function. I'm gonna go back home. And now here's another way of finding um, resources in Azure. There's a little hamburger fly out menu here. And there's some favorites here down the side of what I normally would use or what Azure think I should use. Or I can say, create a resource. So we're gonna create a resource. And in here, I could, if there's an actual function here, there's a function app that's right here. So some of them very popular ones are right here. Or I could type in function, which will also search the marketplace. So there's a Makana Python function, there's et cetera, right? Puppeteer on Azure functions. So those are some probably third-party marketplace apps, but I'm just gonna go for the function app. Uh, and it gives you some ideas what it is. But yes, I wanna create a function app. Now, a function app is, again, a logic, con logical container. Well, I say it's more than a logical container, but it's, 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 the, it's where your function lives. It lives inside of a function app. And I'll just show you, there's a really neat little feature of this that a lot of people miss, which I'm always excited about sharing. So we just call this SLC net functions, function app. And... So you got to choose again, code or Docker. I'm just going to choose code because we're going to see the code. Choose your runtime stack. So whatever you think, you can even have PowerShell functions if you wanted to. I'm going to choose .NET because, well, <laughs> SLC.NET kind of gives it away. Choose a version, .NET 6 or 3.1. Usually they have the LTS versions here. Uh, sometimes there's a preview version, but I'm just going to go with .NET 6, obviously. And I'm going to choose again, Australia East. Choose your operating system, Linux or Windows. It doesn't matter a whole lot in this case, but I'm just going to stick with Windows. And now here's the, the, the cool bit. Most people go, well, it's Azure Function, it's serverless. Of course, I'm going to choose serverless. Like, why would I not? But there's other ways of doing it. So you have functions premium. That is, if you have a really important function that doesn't run very often, but it must run really fast when it runs, if you don't have a function, a premium function, that means that there's a cold start. So when the VM that runs it starts up, that takes some time, a few seconds. If you want to get rid of that, you can have a premium function, which always have a hot instance or warm instance ready to serve your function, right? So you pay more because there's always a VM running for you. Otherwise, there wouldn't be one and you wouldn't pay until it spins one up. So that's a good one. But the best one is the app service plan. An app service plan is where you normally would host your website, your app services. So if you have a WordPress website on, on Azure, it lives inside an app service, which is inside an app service plan. If you have your, um, um, your API app, 
that would be inside an app service plan, etc. You can also have a function app inside your app service plan. The cool thing is an app service plan is just a VM. It's, it's you know, Microsoft speak for a VM that you don't manage. So you choose the size of it. You choose how much compute power it has and you pay a, a, a bunch of money every month to have that available. But you can host all sorts of things on it. You get multiple app services and you can also have function apps. So if you have a team or, you know, a company, whatever, that has a function app, sorry, an app service plan that they're already paying for, it doesn't cost anything extra to put the function app in there. So that's kind of a neat feature, I think. And most people just go, no, of course, it's, it's serverless. I'm going to go consumption. And yes, the first many, many iterations of consumption is free, but then you start paying. So you know, it depends on what you're after. All right. No, I'm not going to. Ah, and of course, I choose app service plan. I'm going to choose consumption for this particular exam. But yeah, it's, it's, good. it's again one of those little things in the wizard that you go, oh, yeah, next, next, next. But it actually can save you a ton of money if you're in the right circumstances. And then we go hosting. So it needs a storage account to host metadata about the functions, like where does the code go, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I'm just going to choose the same one we have uh, used so far. So what it does, it just creates another blob container with store stuff, uh, metadata about it. Networking for your function app, you can have, I'm not going to go through this, but you know, networking <clears throat> parts if you are a networking nerd. I don't understand that much about networking, if I'm honest. I'm a software dev. Um, if you want to enable application insights, uh, that is a talk on itself, but application insight is probably the best developer tool on Azure. It helps you with everything. So just yeah, look it up if, you, if you're more interested in that. And then I'm just going to click review and create. So I'm going to jump in on the application insights. So if yes. you are interested in application insights, um, it, check out our YouTube channel. Uh, and because uh, one of our board members did a talk not too long ago about um, mo monitoring and, and insights from application insights. So there, it's, there it's is brilliant. a talk out there on our YouTube channel about that. Yeah, go watch it. If, if you're interested in Azure development, um, App Insights is just so good. Right? It's a rabbit hole. You can forever drill down the stack of what happened, but it's so useful. <laughs> All right, so we're just deploying our function app. This sometimes takes a minute. Um, some, some resources on Azure take a long time to spin up. Um, Cosmos DB used to take uh, like 10 minutes or something, but I think it seems to be a lot quicker these days, so they must have changed something. Um, VMs can take a while because obviously when you create a VM, it's got to have a, a virtual network cart. It's got to have storage attached to it. It's got to have all these things, right, networking. So there we go. So again, I can go to my resource, which is my function app. <clears throat> so this again is not a function it's a function app my functions live inside the function app um, but all of the functions in this function app will then be serverless or consumption if it were if i chose an app service plan well they would all run on that app service plan right so the function app sort of holds all that together all right so <clears throat> um doo -doo -doo -doo. the functions live in here under well functions funny that um, so right now we don't have any, as you can tell, oh, actually what I can do is it's just a website. So it has a URL here. If I open that website for my function app, it just says your function app is up and running, right? So it's just a website. You can absolutely have a website running off of Azure functions, either fully or to some extent. So just bear that in mind. Again, it's just a server. We're just running a VM that has a web front end. Um, so let's go to functions and I'm gonna create a function. And now we get to choose um, a development environment. This is quite important to get right or, or to make a choice at least. Um, because if you choose Visual Studio or Visual Studio Code, every time you then deploy from there, it will overwrite whatever's on here. So it won't honor anything you edit in the portal. Whereas the same way the other way, if you develop in the portal and you start fiddling in Visual Studio with the code, because you can, well, you're going to make a mess of it. So you got to choose which develop environment first up that you want to use. Now we're going to develop the portal because, well, it's just a simple demo today. Um, but normally I would probably use VS Code or Visual Studio, Visual Studio fully, right? 
Okay. And then there's a bunch of templates. And these for once are pretty good templates. Um, I actually tend to use these quite a bit because they, they cover most of what functions do. Uh, the most common one is HTTP trigger. As it says, it will just run whenever it receives an HTTP request, right? Usually that's a get request. It can be a post request if you've got data to send out. Um, a very common. And that's the whole idea of functions. Super simple. Um, you can have a timer one. So an example I've used in the past is I would have a ticketing system that would create tickets for a certain thing. Every couple of hours, it would run and say, have any of these tickets expired? No one's actioned them or whatever it needs to do. That would be a timer trigger, right? Now, in this case, I'm going to use a Azure Blob Storage trigger because that's what we're doing. And then there's a few more details. Whoops, down here. So we just give it a function name and we're going to call this resize attachment because that's what it's doing. And then the path here is going to be what was the name we uh, gave it? Um, that was. What did we call the container again? Original image, didn't we? Original image or images? Let me just go check. So we want to get this right. Original images. Okay. So I'm saying, where do I go? What am I attaching this blob trigger to? Which, which path? And again, the path is just the blob container. And then there's a variable here, which is name, right? And then the storage account connection, just leave it at Azure Web Job Storage. And it will, um, we'll, we'll connect it in just a minute. There we go. So we'll create that. Do, 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 do. Come on. And there, oh, there it is. It opens up. Cool. So it opens up on this not very useful overview, to be honest. Um, I don't really use this for anything. <laughs> um, what I can, which is what is useful, is this integration part of it here. So this shows us the flow of our Azure function. So we have a trigger which is Azure Blob Storage. And it's gonna be my blob here is the, let me just make sure I get all of this right. Let's be honest. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Yep. Um, so this is the trigger that we just created. Then there's the actual function and then we did an output. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Um, the output is the resized image. So where is it putting that, right? And I'm gonna add an output and this will be a blob storage container. Uh, blob output parameter, output blob, that's fine. That's We'll see that in a minute. That's just the name of it. And this is gonna be, we're gonna call this resized images, right? Now that path doesn't exist yet. So we have to go and create that in just a second. Um, and um, that will be where we put the resized image. So let me just go in there. Go and create that. So if I go back to here, original image, we're going to need a container. And was it resized images? I forgot already. <laughs> resized images. Yep. So we're just going to create another, we're just going to do an anonymous access, another blob container. All right. And you can see here is the two for the function app. Those are containers for the function app here. Um, so now we have the resize images where we're going to put the uh, the resized attachment. All right. So now we can open the function, which is resize attachment. So this is the coding experience. And yes, I know we're coding in a web browser in an Azure portal kind of instance, but you know, bear with me. It's not as bad as it sounds. Um, so this is the uh, default Azure function code you get, which is there's always a run function. That's where it starts. And then it has a bunch of um, inputs and these obviously can change. Now it has made these to match um, the, the trigger that we created, right? So the stream is the actual blob coming in and that's the name of the blob. Now I'm just gonna go and copy some code and cheat a bit because uh, you don't wanna see me coding. Okay, so I'm gonna see, this is gonna work. Okay, bear with me. Okay, like this. So in order to, to resize it, I'm using a library called Six Labors Image Sharp. Uh, so Six Labors is the, um, is the company or the entity that's made it. Image Sharp is the library name. And again, um, here's our output blob. 
So we're going to output a blob, which is our resized blob. We're still going to log it. And then we're going to do um, using this image, the my blob, whoops, there, which comes through from the trigger. I'm going to load that into it. So image.load is part of six labels. Why does it click up there if I click on here? Anyway, and then I'm going to mutate it. So that's the function for in that library that allows me to do stuff with the image. And yes, I'm resizing to 100 by 100, which will skew it unless I put in a square photo um, or image. But it's just the demo, right? We're not too worried about the code right now. And I'm going to save it as a output blob, which is what then. So if I save this, let's go back to the integration here. Come on. The output blob is what gets put into the Azure blob storage. Does that make sense? So I have a trigger that gets the image as soon as it's put in there, that triggers the function. The function runs, resizes it, and puts it in as an output into Azure storage again in the other container. So that's the plan. Now we have one problem left to solve with the uh, function. How does it know where to get this from, right? I've just put it in a using statement. Now, if this was Visual Studio, it would go, um, excuse me, uh, I don't know where to get that. Can you just uh, let me know how do I use this six labels thing you just told me? So in here, we can also do the same thing, which is we can upload a functions file. So if I click upload here, and no, we don't want Swedish tickets. Uh, hang on, two seconds. Let me bear with me a sec. I'm just gonna move it over here. Just so I don't start showing stuff on YouTube, I shouldn't. Um, okay. So I'm gonna upload a, uh, hang on. Talk to much yourselves. Where'd it go? Do, 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 do. Ah, I know, sorry, put it in there, there we go. So I can upload a function.proj. Now the weird thing is, so if I go in here, you can see it's already got it here, function.proj. It shows there's nothing, which is very odd because the file always has something in it. So that might be an editor fault, but this is what the file has in it. <clears throat> and if you're familiar with Visual Studio, this will look very familiar. It's just a reference to a framework, a package reference, right? Um, so that's all I need to do. And this function.proj is part of the Azure function structure, right? So that's where you put in references. And then when I save it, it starts um, compiling it. So now it's package restored, great. Scripts changed, reloading, compilation succeeded. Yay, so it looks like it's working. Oh, well, it's compiling. <laughs> Compiles on my machine. Um, so let's test it. Right, so I'm going to send another email and we'll see. I'm just going to go back here. Here, okay, we got it here. All right, so I'm going to go back to our logic app in here, SLC net image fetch. And <clears throat> now Simon's question earlier, I don't want to forget it. Uh, is there much delay in spin up time for Azure function similar to AWS Lambda? So I can't, I hope I kind of answered that with the, um, the premium tier and the not premium tier. So there is a delay, uh, but you can get around that with, with using premium. Cool. Awesome, thanks, Armin. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna email myself again, that's what we do. Okay, to me again, hello. And we're gonna do SLC net image two. And then we're gonna add an image. I'm just gonna add the same image because then we can see it being resized. <clears throat> Actually, is that going to work? I wonder if there's a, let's see. I wonder if there's a name clash now because I'm not renaming it if there's a different name. Let's see what happens. This could be interesting. And we're going to send that. <clears throat> All right. Anyone want to guess? Is this going to work? Yeah, shoot, is this a new GUID? Yes. Yep. I think it works too. But yeah, I just received the image. I don't know if you heard it. So we're going to run the trigger. Again, this would run eventually. You can see it's already succeeded once. Um, and, okay, that's probably time enough, I'm guessing. Let's go into original images first. 
Oh no, there's only one. There's only one. Oh, do you think I did the break? Um, refresh that. Oh, so it hasn't run. Come on. Maybe. There we go. Six. Oh no. <laughs> Disappeared. Let's see. No, I'm not sure it worked. I might, because of my crude code, it might not. It might not. Let's give it one last thing. I'm not sure it did. Let's just, I'm just going to email myself again. And I might get two if it did work. It might just be a slight delay. It does happen. Like it's it's not perfect always. Uh, image three, four, three. Okay, I'm going to choose a different image. Let's see what we got. Uh, oh, what about this? Very nice. God knows what that is. I can't tell. I do lots of screenshots with Snagit, and I just save them on the desktop for tweets or messages to people or whatever. So who knows what this is? It's a screenshot from somewhere. I'm going to send that again. Just make sure that comes through. And just look at my Outlook, make sure it comes through. There we go. And I'm going to run the trigger again. Oh, so there we go. That was that just, that was just now, wasn't it? Huh, interesting. I wonder, anyway, if anyone can, no, come on, come on. I'm just going to look at this and see what it actually got. 1048, that was now. It's 1048 a.m. here, so it's local time, my, my time here. Hmm. Yep, input, download the input. I wonder where that goes. Right, yeah, perfect. There we go. Uh-huh. So put that in, okay. Why is it not there? What am I doing wrong? Anyone? There's always the, the fun bit when I get to this part. I don't know. That's the one. Oh, did it just override it? I reckon it just overrode it because it was already there. So then the question is, did it trigger it? See, I'm learning something new every day as well. So let's have a look at the other storage account or in resized images. Aha. So it did it twice. It did do it. Right, so in here, I have a blob. Now, I one thing I, I haven't done here is I haven't added a file extension, right, with the resizing. It just gives it a GUID. So if I go in here and I say, open that, it's going to download it as a, just a random file, right? Now, if I then go into downloads, oops, and... I then rename this, I'm just looking at the other screen here, to go.jpg. You can see it here. It resized it. I mean, it skewed it, yes, but it resized it. So, yeah, there's a couple of improvements, as always. This is a prototype thing, right? Um, I need to add a file extension, which I can get out of the Logic app. I can get the file extension, I believe. Um, I need to check if it's an image, you know, I need to have some sort of thing like, well, what if it's the same image? Cause then the same file name as we saw, it still triggers it. It just overwrites it. Right. So that might, I might want to do something with that. So there's a few different things that, that I could improve. Absolutely. But yeah, I'm, give me your questions because that's sort of the end of that flow of doing an actual serverless workflow of something that might be of use. Um, but yeah, let me know. Um, I'm just going to stop sharing here for the minute. I went, oh, I went, what, six minutes over. Sorry, Gary. No questions. Oh, well, that means must mean you've understood everything. Yeah, Gary, I don't, I'm not sure what you said. I think you're muted, Gary. <laughs> I said, I've got to find my buttons. <laughs> 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 the buttons were gone. So, uh, no, that was very impressive. Uh, uh, I I, uh, I commented commented wow in the comments when you uh, had had dropped the, the thing about the attachment and it and it knew instinctively, I guess, that it needed to do a for each. I thought that was really impressive. So, um, yeah, lots the, oh, of, actually, lots of neat little tricks. 
one thing, because we are in a developer crowd here, let me just show you one more thing that I think may bring some joy to those that went, but I want code in the Logic app. Uh, you can actually go in and, whoop, where is it? Uh, say the app code view, because this is just JSON, right? The whole Logic app is just JSON. And that's why you can also deploy it in a container, in a Docker container. And you can absolutely version this. You can have it in GitHub. You can have it wherever. It is just a JSON file. It's just that writing all this out in JSON doesn't give you anywhere near the same overview as doing it in the designer, right? But there is actual code behind it. <laughs> and you can do code things with it. Very cool. Well, that was impressive. Does anybody have any questions for Lars? So I should be able to the... answer them. <laughs> Or any comments? So you can see the code with the Azure function. Can you do it with the Logic app too? Does it have code you can view? That was the Logic app I just showed you. That whole JSON part of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and in fact, you can get the whole designer experience and the JSON inside VS Code. There's a, a Logic app plugin for VS Code that allows you to do everything in VS Code as well. So you can have it as a file on your GitHub that you manage on your, your locally and, and do the whole merge and whatnot, push and merge, right? So there's a, there's a full developer workflow behind it. So there was a hand that went up somewhere. Yeah, I'm not sure whether that was a clapping or a hand. Charles, did you oh. have a question or comment or were you just celebrating? It was just a clap. It was an awesome. All right. Cool. No worries. Excellent. So let me, um, uh, let me share. Oh, Simon my has a question here. It says, just to go over the test again, did we overwrite the file? Or did the second email trigger the conversion using these? Info? I think we overwrote the file. I'm pretty, pretty certain that, um, and that knowing Azure Storage, there's a million settings, and one of them probably would be don't replace kind of thing. And it might either give it, you know, the, the stupid bracket two that Windows always does. It might actually be something useful. I'm not sure. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure it overwrote it. Sorry, Gary, go ahead. Okay. I am uh, trying to make sure that I get the right the right view here. I think that's what I want. Okay. So everybody should be able to see the slide with a bunch of links, right? Yes. Excellent. So I am also going to, um, I'm going to paste a bunch, a bunch of links into the chat. Uh, so, so you don't have to type any of these in. Uh,